Good morning, everyone. I am so excited to welcome you to chapel today for our special Portrait and Faith event with presiding Bishop Michael Curry. Um, he's joined today by his canon, Seth, Stephanie Spellers, who's the canon for Evangelism, Reconciliation, and Creation. Just sounds like a really small job that she's working on. But we also know her in this community as our 2015 theologian in residence, where she came and spent a week in January with us about five years ago. So I'm super excited that all of you are here. Special welcome to our friends from St. Albans and St. Stephen St. Agnes and VTS. Can we welcome them as well, please? We will be uh, opening our service today with All Are Welcome. It's in your chapel songbook, which is the maroon binder in front of you. We will be singing verses 1, 4, and 5. So when you find All Are Welcome, please stand and sing.
as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. The Lord be with you. you. Let us pray. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin nor become overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. A reading from the prophet Nehemiah. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book from the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to, to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word of the Lord. Please join me in reading Psalm 19, found in the Book of Common Prayer in front of you. This is the book with the cross on the front. The psalm is on page 606. We will read Psalm 19 with 11th and 12th grade students reading the odd verses with me and 9th and 10th grade students reading the even verses. Adults, please divide yourselves as you wish. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Good morning. Good morning. It is my honor and my privilege to welcome an extraordinarily special guest to Episcopal High School today, the 27th Presiding Bishop and Primate of the Episcopal Church, the Most Reverend Michael Bruce Curry. Presiding Bishop Curry was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, to a devout Episcopalian family. His father was an Episcopal priest, and from a young age, his father's leadership shaped his beliefs on social activism and living a life in service to others. The presiding bishop was ordained in 1978 and was rector to three parishes in North Carolina, Ohio, and Maryland, respectively, before being elected as bishop to the Episcopal Diocese of North Carolina. In all three states where he served, he placed an emphasis on supporting youth, specifically in impoverished areas. Bishop Curry maintains a full national and international preaching and teaching network. In fact, he is coming to us today from a revival weekend in the Diocese of Southwestern Virginia. He has preached in churches and cathedrals all over the country and the world, emphasizing racial reconciliation, creation care, and evangelism for people inside the Episcopal Church, people of other traditions, and people of goodwill. He is the author of four books and numerous publications, editorials, and columns. In fact, he was named 2018's Newsmaker of the Year by the Religious News Association. That might have something to do with a little homily he gave at the royal wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. <laughs> but it is also a reflection of his amazing ability to connect deeply to others and to talk about real things that matter. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our 2019 Fortune and Faith honoree, the Most Reverend Michael Bruce Curry. Thank you, Thank you buddy. Thank you, Paul, and, and, and thank you. Um, thank you to your head of school, head of school and your chaplains and um, all who are part of this remarkable and wonderful community. It, it really is a blessing and a privilege for me to be able to be with you and those who are with us by simulcast wherever they may be as well. So it's, it's good to be here. And I really am glad to be here because I didn't know whether we'd have snow or what, but I'm just glad to be here this morning. I hope you are. If you are, or even if you're not, just turn to the person next to you and tell them, I'm glad to be here. It's good to be here. Now go on. Tell them. Good to be here. It's good, good to be here. Well, let me offer um, just a few words on the uh, reading you just heard a few moments ago. It comes from Luke's Gospel, the very beginning of the work of Jesus, and as he's beginning his teaching and his serving ministry, and he goes to his hometown and enters the synagogue, probably where he grew up, and all the home folk were there. And I, I know there's some home folk here. I was bishop of North Carolina. I got a feeling there's some tar heels in the house. Anybody from North Carolina here? All right, all right, we got some heels here, all right. And um, so he went to his hometown. I grew up in Buffalo, and, and I saw one of your teachers is from Buffalo. And yeah, we're loyal fans of the Buffalo Bills. Proof that faith endures. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jesus went home and went to the synagogue, maybe where he had grown up, and he unrolled the scroll as the scriptures were found in those days and he opened it to the reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah in the Hebrew scriptures and this is what he read the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim relief to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind 
to set at liberty all those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year, to proclaim the jubilee year, to proclaim that great getting up morning, to proclaim the reign of God, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now in those words and what happens after that, you get a glimpse of what Jesus of Nazareth is about. What you hear in those words and what happens after that are a witness to the way of Jesus, which is nothing less than and nothing more than the way of unselfish, sacrificial love the way that can change the world. The old slaves used to sing it this way. If you cannot preach like Peter and you cannot pray like Paul, you just tell the love of Jesus, how he died to save us all. And then they would go into the refrain, oh, that's the healing bomb, that's the healing power. They would say, oh, there is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. Oh, there is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. If you don't remember anything else I say, and if you go to sleep in the next two minutes, just remember that this brother said, love is the way. It's not only the way, it's the only way. There is no other way that will work for us all. Love is the way. In fact, turn and tell your neighbor, doggone it, love is the way. Tell us. Love is the way. It's the way. It's the way. Now, now, now I, I didn't say it was easy. And sometimes it will get you in trouble. But that's what you see in Jesus of Nazareth. That's what you see in the great spirits who have inhabited this world every once in a while, that, 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 that they exude a kind of, of, of love that, that actually makes room and space for others, because that's what love does. Love is, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 said, love is not jealous, love is not rude, love is not selfish, love does not insist on its own way, which is a way of saying that love makes plenty good room, as the old slaves used to say. Love makes room and space for the other to be, and when the other is allowed to be, then the self gets blessed too. Love. Now, after Jesus said these lovely words and read them, and he read them with such eloquence, everybody in the synagogue said, oh, is this Joseph's son? Is this Mary's baby? My, how he's grown up. Everybody was just proud of the hometown boy made good. And he said he reads so well. But then Jesus began, and you can read this in chapter 4 of Luke's Gospel, he began to apply what he had just read, which old folk used to say he went from preaching to meddling. And when he applied the words, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty all those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year, year of the Lord. Everybody said, that's good. He said, now you know what this means. Go back into the Hebrew scriptures of the Jewish people. Go back into, into the tradition. And you'll remember that the prophet Elijah went to a widow of a place called Zarephath. And, and he went to her and brought healing into her life and included her in God's love. Folks started grumbling. They said, wait, wait, she's not one of us. But see, the widow of Zarephath, first of all, she was a woman. And, and prophets weren't supposed to be speaking directly to women like that. And the prophet went, and Jesus is, is, is patting this prophet on the back. Secondly, she was a Gentile. She was other. Folk were beginning to rumble. But then Jesus went on and he said, and you remember the prophet Elisha. And the prophet Elisha, when there was a man named Naaman who needed a healing, the prophet went to him. Folk really started grumbling. 
And they said, wait a minute, Naaman, he's not like us either. He's not one of us. And worse than that, he was of the conquering army that tried to oppress us. You telling us we got to love our enemies? And worse than that, Naaman had leprosy. In those days, folk who had leprosy were considered unclean. They were the other, and worse than that, they were outcasts. They were people that people were afraid of because they were afraid of the disease. I remember when I was a young priest in the 1980s, when the AIDS epidemic first hit, we didn't know what caused it. We didn't know how you caught it, and people were afraid. In America, people were afraid. And folk were afraid of folk with AIDS and wouldn't touch them. And then we had to learn everybody's a child of God. We had to learn about the disease. And thank God we've got drugs that can help to contain it now. And we've learned better, but leprosy was AIDS, HIV AIDS in the first century. And Jesus said, Elisha touched the leper and made him part of the community. And you know what happened? You read chapter four in Luke. They ran Jesus out of town. They ran that brother out of town. Y'all didn't know Jesus got run out of town. <laughs> they ran that brother out of town so fast, but they said, my man just kind of just stepped on out. Just stepped on out, because Jesus was cool. <laughs> What's going on here is that you're seeing love embodied in Jesus and his way. A love that brings healing to broken lives. A love that lifts up those who are downcast. A love that will set us all free. A love that makes room, plenty good room, for all of God's children. Oh, I'm here to tell you, love is the way. It's the only way. And there is no other way. I was watching a wonderful um, documentary film on television over the Christmas holiday. Um, it was titled, I don't know if y'all saw it, Notorious RBG. Did y'all, anybody see it? Some of you saw it, it's about Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a remarkable woman, a remarkable somebody, I mean, I'm sure, sure y'all know about it. This is a remarkable sister, let me tell you. Um, and, and this, the, the documentary was based on some young women had, had done some of the work earlier on. And, um, you know, some of y'all may know about Notorious B.I.G. And so this was about the Notorious R.B.G., Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I never thought you could co combine those two together in the same sentence before, but somehow they did it. And it was a wonderful uh, bio, uh, documentary on her and on her life. This, was, this is someone right now still living in our midst. This is a woman who stood up for the equality and dignity of women long before it was safe, popular, or fashionable. Stood up, had the courage to stand up for what is right, for what is decent, for what is, that's what love looks like, y'all. But, but, but not only that, she has the courage to live that. She's now a justice on the Supreme Court. And for years while he lived, one of her best friends was Justice Anton Scalia. As liberal as she is, he was equally conservative. They probably didn't agree on very much, but they were best friends. And in the documentary, they talked to her about their friendship and the friendship between their two families. And part of it had to do with, she said at one point, we both love opera. And that love of opera kind of brought us together. But more than that, she said, we both love the Constitution of the United States and believe in what it stands for. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union. And it was that love of the Constitution that gave them common ground. But then she went on and said a little bit more. She, she, she started talking about the Constitution. And she said, you know, the Constitution hasn't always had the authority that we give it now. 
She went on to explain, and you probably know better than I, in the case of Marbury versus Madison, 1803. This was before the Constitution was seen the way we see it now. Um, up to that point, remember after the Revolutionary War, you know, remember we had the Articles of Confederation, y'all remember that? Y'all learn, do they still teach that in school? Oh, okay, yeah. You had the Articles of Confederation and then eventually you get the U.S. Constitution. Well, um, the, the 13 original colonies um, and eventually the states kind of saw themselves as independent. Um, those of us from the South know what I'm talking about. Uh, saw themselves as kind of independent, if you will. And it took a while to create a federal nation, if you will, um, and understand that we have one constitution that governs us. In the case of Marbury versus Madison, really that case, that issue crystallized and it was finally in that case that the Supreme Court ruled that all law in this country, whether it is local, state, or enacted by Congress, must be consistent with and conform to the Constitution because the Constitution is, and I quote, the supreme law of the land. And if a law, if, let me say it this way, if it doesn't jive with the Constitution, it's not American. Yeah, it's just that simple. When she said that, I remembered a passage in the 22nd chapter of Matthew's Gospel. A lawyer like Justice Ginsburg, like the late Justice Scalia, came up to Jesus and he said, great teacher, tell me, what is the greatest law in the entire legal edifice of Moses? Jesus stepped back and reached back into the Hebrew scriptures and pulled something out of Deuteronomy and pulled something else out of Leviticus. And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And then he says, and the second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, love of God, love of neighbor, on this hangs all the law and the prophets. And it dawned on me that there was the religious Marbury versus Madison. The supreme law of God is to love. You want to know the heart of God? You want to know what God is about? You want to know the will of God? 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 says, and I quote, Beloved, let us love one another because love is of God and those who love are born of God and know God because God is love, period, exclamation point. If it's not about love, it's not about God. If it doesn't jive with Jesus and love, it's just jive. <laughs> and that is a truth that transcends all our religions. That is a truth that transcends all our politics. That is a truth that transcends all our differences. That is a truth that can bind us together. I, Paul said, I was at a wedding a couple months ago. <laughs> There's a little place across the pond. It was a lovely affair, you know. <laughs> nice family, they didn't spare a, a dime. Um, <laughs> and um, after, after the wedding, which was wonderful, it really was, was quite, it was just wonderful. Um, you know, um, after the wedding was over, I, you know, I got on, on the flight to fly back to New York to where the church office is. And so I hadn't really thought, of, I really didn't know I knew people, I knew, well, I didn't know at the time, but I now know two billion people watched it. I'm glad I didn't know that ahead of time, but, but I knew a lot of people had seen it, but I didn't know what the reaction was. I really didn't because we were, we couldn't use cell phones or anything uh, while we were in Windsor Castle. You couldn't, everything was off. And literally I left there, uh, went to a youth rally with the Archbishop of Canterbury and was with a thousand young people in the St. Albans Cathedral. And I was with them until late Sunday night um, went to bed, got up at five, got to Heathrow, and flew back to the state. So I didn't know what was going on. And actually, my plan for the sermon was, I figured I'd just stay under the radar so nobody would notice. Anyway, I get home. As soon as I get to JFK, there are cameras. And I said, well, I wonder who they're here to see. 
And <laughs> next thing I know, there, were, there was all this interest. I said, well, I was here before. Nobody was interested, but OK. <laughs> and so finally, you know, after doing a number of interviews and different and all that kind of stuff, I was asked to do an interview with TMZ. <laughs> now, I knew ABC and NBC, but I only vaguely knew TMZ. And so I said, OK. <laughs> and the poor communication director at the Episcopal Church said, no, not TMZ. You can't do that. <laughs> so anyway, I did it and had a wonderful time. They were just as wonderful. But they asked, you know, the usual questions. Did I see Oprah? Yeah, I said, I saw Oprah. Did you see George Clooney? I said, yeah, I saw George Clooney. Did you see the queen? Well, yeah, she was there, obviously. Uh, and it went on. And then they asked me something that made me really pause. They said, you talked about love in that sermon. And the truth is, we, there's something in all of us that really wants to believe that it's true. But then they said, but our audience is young. And some of them may be wondering, will this love thing really work? Will it really work? And I have to tell you, they stopped me, right? They, that made me pause. And I replied, when I thought about it, it's the only thing that has ever worked. I mean, if you just think of love as a sentiment, well, of course. But if you understand that love is a commitment, it is a commitment to seek the good, a commitment to seek the welfare, not just of the self, but of others, a commitment to a new and a better world. That if you understand that's what love is, that's what Jesus was about, then yes, love works, it's not easy, and truth is it's the only thing that has ever worked. There has never been any social cause that has done human good based on selfishness. It's been love seeking the good and the welfare of others. Think about somebody in your own life who has actually made a difference in your life for, for the good. They did it for you because they cared about you, not primarily for what they could get out of it themselves. Love is the only thing that has ever done any real good in human life and society. Love is the way. In fact, it's the only way. I saw that, and I'm going to sit down in a minute. I'm going to sit down. You know the definition of an optimist? Do y'all know that? The definition of an optimist? That when a preacher says, and in conclusion, <laughs> that that's not, a met that's not literal, that's a metaphor. But anyway, but I am going to sit down. But some years ago, when I was Bishop of North Carolina, I was up at the Canuga Conference Center up in the mountains in Western, in Western North Carolina, and um, I got a call from Frank Griswold, who was the then presiding bishop. And, and uh, I say, well, Frank, what, what do you want? Because I was a young bishop at that point. It was about 2001, 2002. I was a young bishop. And he said, um, I, I, I need you to uh, help me out a bit. And I'm thinking the presiding bishop wants me to help him out. And he said, yeah. He said, there's going to be um, an installation or enthronement of the new archbishop um, in the Anglican province of Burundi, uh, which is in central East Africa. Um, and I said, yeah. He said, I can't go, but I want to send a delegation of bishops to represent the American church, the Episcopal church, at the enthronement. And I said, well, I probably need to check my schedule. And he said, no, I've already talked to your assistant. I've checked your schedule. <laughs> You're available. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. Um, of course, sure, I'll go. So, you know, hung up from that, and the arrangements are all getting made. And um, this is about, it may have been 2004, actually. Uh, 2004. Anyway, um, the arrangements were made. We were trying to, I was readjusting everything and doing what I needed to do so I could get there. And the Bishop of Colorado was going to go with me and the two of us were going to represent, represent you. So we, um, everything was going on and I got a phone call from the presiding bishop's office um, from his canon at the time, like Canon Stephanie, who called and said, uh, Bishop Curry, we just want you to know we've taken out some extra life insurance policy on you. And I said, well, why? why? He said, well, um, you know, as you may or may not know, Burundi is just coming out of a civil war. I said, 
yes, I, I knew that. Um, and he said, so we've taken out the life insurance policy just as a precaution. And I said, well, thank you very much. I'm sure my wife will be happy. But anyway, <laughs> so, um, you know, I hung up the phone and then I proceeded immediately to get on the internet to Google Burundi. Because I knew Burundi, but I didn't know a lot about it. And Google Burundi and come to find out. Anybody see the movie Hotel Rwanda? Burundi's just underneath B Rwanda. And what was going on in Rwanda as genocide between Tutsi and Hutu was actually civil war in Burundi. And the first sentence, I went to the CIA website, because I figured they should know. So I, I went to the CIA website, and the first sentence said, the United States State Department strongly discourages American citizens from traveling to Burundi. And I said, I had wondered why I was being selected for this mission. <laughs> So at that point, I, I didn't actually show that to my wife, but anyway, I said, oh man, this is, this is kind of deep. And um, they had just settled, had just uh, signed the peace treaties um, from five, there were five warring factions at the time, had just signed the peace treaties. Um, and so it was a fragile peace. Uh, but anyway, I said, we, we just got to go. And so got on the plane and flew from, um, from Raleigh to New York and then from New York to London, from London to Nairobi, and then from Nairobi to Bujumbura, the capital city of Burundi. And as we made the approach, and I had traveled the world before, but I had never been anywhere where there had just been a civil war. As we made our approach over the city of Bujumbura to land in the airport, we circled, and as we circled, you could see the city. It was a heap of rubble. There's a passage in the Lamentations of Jeremiah in the Hebrew scriptures, how lonely sits the city that was once full of people. And we made our approach and slowly but surely landed. And when we landed, we were met by clergy from the church and deacons with machetes in the back of the jeep. We drove into the city, and we were given instructions that if a problem arose, we were to go to the lobby of the hotel and wait for the United Nations, because there was no American embassy there then. And I was remember thinking, could you just give me one U.S. Marine, please? <laughs> just one? <laughs> and we got to the hotel. And we were in good hands because the church folk, they took care of us. We went to the enthronement. The Archbishop of Canterbury came from England because they wanted Burundi to know that the world was standing with them and that the Anglican church was standing with them. And after the service and the enthronement, the new Archbishop, Archbishop Bernard Maturi, took we Americans on a tour of the city and at one point he sat, we were at the top, kind of at the top of a hill in the city, and he sat down on a heap of rubble, and he pointed to the rubble that was the city. And he said, this is man's way. Jesus has shown us God's way. And God's way is love. And that is the only way we will rebuild Burundi. And they've done it. There have been setbacks, but they've done it. They did it by bringing the differing groups who disagreed with each other. They brought Tutsi and Hutu and Pygmy together. They brought capitalists and communists together. They worked together to build a common country, a common civilization. And the next time I saw Archbishop Natari, I was in London with him, and we were at the Lambeth Conference of Bishops in 2008, and he said, Michael, I've got good news for you. I said, what's that? He said, Starbucks has come to Burundi. I never thought Starbucks would be a sign of the kingdom of God, but apparently it was. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, the way of love, the way of unselfish, sacrificial living is the way of life. It is the only way of life. It's the way of life for us all. It can lift us up when the gravity of reality pulls us down. It can set us free 
from whatever hinders and prevents us. Love your God. Love each other. And while you're at it, love yourself. Now, if you cannot preach like Peter, and you cannot pray like Paul, you just tell the love of Jesus how he died to save us all. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. God love you. God bless you. And may God hold us all in those almighty hands of love.
kneel for prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God, ruler of the universe. You have poured out upon us the riches of creation, filling our lives with the products of earth and sea. You demonstrate your generosity and graciousness by the provisions you have made for us. Guide us with your spirit, so that the students, families, and faculty of St. Albans, St. Stephen's, and St. Agnes, Virginia Theological Seminary, and Episcopal High School may become beloved communities of justice, learning, and play. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Our closing hymn today can be found in your chapel songbook on page 20. So once you've found it, please prepare to sing Guide My Feet on page 20 of your chapel songbook.
have a seat, everyone. We've got a few minutes to do any questions you might have for our guests. So Rep T is going to have a mic, and so will I. So if you've got a question burning inside you to ask Bishop Curry, we can do it now. What do we got? Any hands? Where are you? Where are you? Anybody? Captive audience? There's Gilbert. Where we go? Where we go? Go, John. It's on. Oh, hi, Bishop Curry. Uh, my name is John Moses. I'm a senior from Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, wonderful. And I guess the question I had is, he talks about love being like the only way. And for some people, like it's pretty hard when love is, seems to be absent. So when, in hard times when love isn't there, or it seems not to be there, what is there to do? That's really a great, can you hear me okay? Are, are you getting, that is a great question. You know what, sometimes you just have to love anyway. And sometimes it has to become a habit. Because there are times when you don't feel it, to be honest. I mean, that's just real. Um, but I really do, I, di I didn't go into it, but one of the things that I'm, I've, I've really realized that, that as long as love is perceived as a sentiment, it, it doesn't have, the, I mean, it starts as a sentiment. There's nothing wrong with sentimental love. I mean, I gotta, I'm married, I know Valentine's Day coming, and I make sure I have flowers, and all that. I do all But when love is a commitment, it's a spiritual practice, and almost a spiritual discipline. Um, in 1963, and this is related to what you're talking about, 1963, um, during the, the struggle for Birmingham, for to desegregate Birmingham, I got kinfolk from, um, from Birmingham. Um, 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 this is the time, this 1963 was when um, 16th Street Baptist Church uh, bomb had been detonated there. Uh, my Aunt Callie was a Sunday school teacher in that church. Um, it was a, a decisive campaign in the civil rights movement. One of the things that Dr. King did was to provide for those who were to participate in the work of nonviolence, which was seen and understood as the way of loving social change, um, social change embodied love. He created um, a ten, uh, what they, they nicknamed the, the ten, Martin, Dr. King's Ten Commandments. Um, and all of the commandments were things like, remember that the goal of the civil rights movement is not victory, but reconciliation. You're to treat every person with love because God is love. Show the ordinary rules of politeness and courtesy to every person, whether they are friend or foe. And it was stuff like that, about uh, nine different things like that, that were working out how you practically live a life based on the principle of love. But the very first one, and this was, this was the important one, he wrote, before you march, meditate on the life and teachings of Jesus. And the reason he did that was because he knew that the way of love sometimes is just hard to do. And that sometimes we need not only to gird up our loins, but we need the amazing grace of God to help us to do it. And the truth is, it's true. Jesus said, love your neighbor. He didn't necessarily say you got to like them. <laughs> but he did say, love them. And sometimes it takes extra help to do that. And sometimes it takes extra help to love yourself. And sometimes it takes extra help to even love God. Because we're human. Desmond Tutu used to often say, actually quoting, I think, St. Augustine, about doing the work of God, which is the work of love. He said, by himself, God won't. By ourselves, we can't. But together with God, we can. Great question. Thank you, man. Right. Bobby's got a question. Hi, I'm Bobby. I'm a senior. Hey, Bobby. Charleston, South Carolina. Um, From so Charleston? Yes. Oh, yeah. Good, good. We got Atlanta, Charleston. All right. Um, I know that there are some people who have tried to love and have like, tried to find love, and sometimes that ends up badly, and mm -hmm. get, people get hurt. Yeah. Um, what do you say to that? That's a good, did, did everybody hear the question? Afraid to love again. Yeah. Afraid, what do you do? What do you do? You know, one thing, I, I mean, one, one thing, I, it helps to not try to do it by yourself. 
in, in all honesty. I mean, do it alone. Um, it, it, as best you can to have a community around you of, of friends who can support you while you're working through, working your way through whatever that happens to be. And find the folk um, who are around you that you can just sit down and talk with. That you can just quietly sit down and talk with, who you can trust. They're there. I mean, I call them sometimes angels in our midst. And those folk, whoever they are, I mean, whether it's a, a fellow student, whether it's others, but don't try to walk that journey by yourself. Find somebody else. That's, that's like the choir was singing that. Y'all were good today. I wish I could take y'all on the road with me. You all are good. <laughs> but that, that, can, can, that cannot get a witness. There's always a witness. Someone that you can be with, one person you can talk with, and hopefully a, maybe a community, a little group of, of friends that you can walk that journey with until you find a way to walk it yourself. There's a story in the New Testament of this guy who was paralyzed and four of his friends were trying to get him to, he wanted to go to Jesus so he could get healed, uh, but he couldn't do it himself because he was paralyzed. And so four of his friends brought him to Jesus and actually they lowered him through the roof as the story goes because there was such a crowd around the house where Jesus was and they actually took the thatch, some of the th thatching off the roof and lowered the guy down in the roof. And, uh, and the New Testament says that when Jesus saw their faith, talking about the four friends, he was just moved deeply because sometimes somebody else has to carry us on the journey and then sometimes we carry them. We need each other. And so find those others. Thank you. Hi, my name is Missy and I'm a junior here from Alexandria. Uh -huh. So if God loves everyone, how do you use that to justify like horrible events that happen to people who have only returned the love? How do you um, use God's love to justify hor horrible events that that have happened to people who have only returned God's love and been good. Yeah, that is a, um, I really believe that there are natural disasters, sicknesses, illnesses, things that just happen that are accidents, if you will, um, that just happen. And we may have medical explanations for them, and try to cure as best we can. Or we may do what we can after the fact, after something has happened. But I don't even remotely believe that God has caused that. God is not the author of anything that hurts or harms anybody. But because we live in the world, bad stuff does, Rabbi, but why do bad things happen to sometimes good people? Well, sometimes bad things just do happen. I can tell you this, and this isn't from me. This is from, um, oh, um, PBS, used to be on TV. Um, Bill Moyers. Uh, Bill uh, Moyers? Not Bill Moyers, no, 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 no. Uh, Mr., um, oh gosh. Mr. Rogers, Mr. yeah. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, yeah. It's intellectual. <laughs> you get to be my age, you forget stuff, yeah. Y'all know Mr. Rogers, you know about Mr. Apparently Mr. Rogers, um, um, at some point when he was a kid, he asked his mother a, a similar question that you're asking. And he was just kind of asking like, so, you know, bad stuff happens, and where's God in that? And his mother said, look for the helpers. Look for the helpers. Where you see the helpers, you're seeing God's hand begin to move. I, I was in East Carolina. Uh, was just in Central Gulf Coast, Panama City, went to Mexico City where hurricanes just ravaged, I mean, destroyed. I mean, in that Mexico City one, it, whether it will ever be there again, I don't, nobody knows. The truth is, the hope are the people who, d after the storm, come in and help. The first responders, those who come to help to rebuild the communities, there's God. And that's what I look for, that's what I live for, and that's what I just hope for. I remember I had surgery, um, I've had surgery a number of times, but I had surgery, and every time, I can't see God, I know God's around, but I like to see God in that surgeon. And a, weight, a surgeon who's awake too. Um, 
But that's where I know, look for the helpers. And there you'll see God. Bishop Curry, would you mind blessing us as we wrap up in here As we today? wrap up? Would you, would you mind blessing us? No, I can't I do know. that. I yeah, know. You're all sure. tuckered out. <laughs> you all are wonderful. I wish I could spend more time with you, but you really are. Um, so now go forth into the world. Go forth into this world in peace. Let's all stand up. Let's stand up. Yeah. Feel it in your feet. All right, here we go. Go forth into the world in peace. Be strong and of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. But love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. And love yourself. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be on you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.